Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on the this the latest in our series of webinars from Toradex. Uh, we're here today to talk a bit about uh, an exciting new feature that's part of our Horizon system um, that allows you to um, update uh, various components of the system, including things like uh, you know microcontroller firmwares um, and, and, and other components that are maybe not directly. A part of uh, the Horizon OS uh, that we provide, uh, and something unique to your application. Uh, briefly about me, my name is Drew Mosley. I'm a uh, solutions architect here at Toradex uh, with a focus on Horizon, uh, both the uh, OS and the cloud side of things. I kind of kind of go up and down the stack on on on, on the full full spectrum of things. Um, I'm an engineer, but I'm not technically a member of the R&D team. So my job is really to, uh, uh, you know, kind of give these kind of talks, uh, communicate with customers, and then and try to figure out how people want to use our products and how overall we can make the, pro the product better for you guys. Um, brief agenda, we'll start uh, talking a little bit about how Horizon does updates just in, in broad strokes. Um, specifically, you know, what are some of the, the building blocks, what are our actualizer, what are Obtain, and why and how do we use them. And then we'll define a subsystem uh, and then uh, talk about the, the, the component called an action handler, which is uh, uh, the, the, the main configuration point for you when configuring these, uh, the, these subsystems. And we'll talk a little bit about the workflows, but uh, we'll spend most of the time uh, hopefully going through the demos, uh, showing how to actually do a couple of different uh, different subsystem updates for some devices I have set up here. So uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat. Uh, we do have, uh, I have some colleagues online who can help if you're having connectivity issues or audio issues or anything like that. Um, a recording will be provided after the session, um, and we will have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, Any time during the, during the prepared uh, section of the, the, the webinar, feel free to add the questions into the, the, uh, the, the questions dialogue, and uh, we'll do our best to get them answered at the end. So before diving into the actual topic of subs subsystem updates, we want to share some details about who we are and what we do at Toradex. Um, our main focus is really to make embedded computing easy. Uh, we really try to make it easy for uh, you as developers to integrate our hardware and software into a real product. Um, we do make ARM-based system on modules and all the accompanying software to help you quickly get your design up and running without having to become an expert on embedded Linux, Yocto, hardware design, and all those other things that are necessary, but maybe not your core competency. And we also focus on providing the lowest total cost of ownership for you over the life of the product. Uh, we do have an extensive global uh, support organization that uh, uh, provides best-in-class customer support, and you can, in most cases, you'll be dealing with someone who's relatively time zone convenient to you, so uh, you get your, your, your questions answered as quickly as possible. Our main markets uh, are kind of shown here, uh, include healthcare, transportation, and a number of others. Uh, you can see that uh, one common theme to all of these industries is really security and reliability, and we really focus on, on that when de developing our products the way we do. Typically, when we're talking about customer volumes, we're dealing in the few hundreds to a few tens of uh, thousands of devices per project, uh, although that's uh, by no means a hard and fast rule. So this shows kind of a, a, a snapshot of our, our product portfolio. Uh, you see that the majority of our uh, portfolio uh, is based on the NXP i.mx family of SOCs, uh, and we are a platinum partner of NXP, one of very few, as a matter of fact. And our, we have a couple new products that we're pretty excited about. One is the TI AM62 SOC-based uh, module, which is targeted, targeted at low-cost applications. And additionally, we have a new, uh, a couple of new offerings based on the the uh, NXP i.mx95 SOC that will be coming out in the, the the coming months, and we're very excited about that. Uh, and if you're new to Horizon, uh, briefly, it's a it's our system to to help you simplify the development and maintenance of your your embedded Linux de devices. 
as a system developer, you get a pre-built Yocto image uh, that you can use actually without becoming a Yocto expert. That's one of the main goals is you don't have to go back to Yocto unless you absolutely need to or want to. Um, we also have partners such as QT and Slint that provide application stacks easily embedded in our tools to help accelerate your application development efforts. Uh, and we also provide easy integration uh, with features such as databases, machine learning, things like that. We use the Docker uh, container runtime on our target. So anything that's available on Docker Hub is uh, very easy to add to your application and, and make use of. And finally, all of this is brought together under a, an extension for the Visual Studio Code IDE uh, to make it really easy and simple for your developers. As part of our cloud services, we have a secure and reliable update system that allows you to update and maintain your devices over the lifetime of the product. Uh, it's based on a framework from the automotive space called Uptain, uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but uh, this, th this framework has been fully vetted uh, by security experts and is designed to, to protect uh, against state-level actor attacks. Uh, this system also includes features such as device monitoring, remote access, uh, things like that that help you maintain and, your, and troubleshoot your devices while in production in the field without necessarily having to put hands on, get hands on access to them. So I use this slide a lot when I'm uh, talking about how um, people develop applications and the challenges they face when developing uh, these kind of connected IoT-based devices. Um, and we recently added the EU Cyber Resiliency Act to this, to, to this list of challenge because that, we're hearing that from a lot of our customers that they're really starting to think about that. And the idea with subsystem updates, it, it, it really helps in the, the, the four components on the right-hand portion of this slide. Um, so depending on exactly how you decide to make use of it, it can really have a, a, a big impact uh, on many aspects of the development of these systems. So let's start with a, a poll and we'll leave that up for a few seconds while, uh, while we get some answers here. All right, answers are starting to come in. All right, I think we're kind of uh, stabilized in terms of percentages, so we can go ahead and share this. Not terribly surprising, about the same as uh, the earlier session this morning. Uh, still a, a large percentage of people are using a custom uh, Roll Your Own solution. Uh, I, and I, I hope over time that'll become, uh, that, that number will be coming down, uh, just because there's a lot of pitfalls uh, that go into uh, designing one of these systems. Um, and then, uh, you know, either a commercial or a open source solution that has an active development community uh, is, is usually a pretty good thing. And I love that people, uh, all, there's always a few people that say their code is perfect. I, I think uh, who, whoever that is, you should come work for us because we could, we could use some uh, developers that never, uh, never write any bugs. So, um, so, so let's talk at the, the highest level about, you know, briefly what is subsystem updates. Um, basically, it's a custom payload type that you can download to a system running to Ryzen uh, using our standard over the air mechanism. So the, the, the snapshot on the bottom of this slide is a, a screenshot uh, from uh, from our actual Horizon uh, dashboard looking at one of the devices here uh, in my office. And you see the, the various components on the device. And this kind of give you an idea of how, how things are split up. One is the base OS. If you're familiar with the internals of Horizon, this is the essentially the OS tree uh, revision that, that, that maps to the booted uh, bootable root file system. Uh, it contains, you know, all the, the outputs of the Octo built itself, as well as things like the Docker runtime and the, uh, the, the, the actualizer update client that, that, that's necessary. Uh, then there's the application component, which in our case is a, it's a Docker compose file that, that specifies the application stack that you're going to be using. Um, and, and those two have been around with Horizon since the since its inception. Uh, re recently, uh, within the I don't know last nine to twelve months or so, we added bootloader updates. And just as kind of a preview, actually, bootloader updates are actually Im implemented using the sus subsystem update feature. Um, and then finally, you see the custom component. So in this case, it's a, a, a component that I've uh, helpfully titled Image Conf. And really, all this is is a um, a, a just a PNG file. Uh, you can kind of see the lighting's not great uh, over my shoulder, uh, but it, it's basically a PNG file that's used as a splash screen uh, for a specific application that we'll be taking a look at here in a bit. 
but it, it's important to note that you know this is all this custom component is updatable using the Horizon Cloud, uh, but it is versioned and managed independently of all the other components you have in your system. So each one of these components you see on the screen right now has a hash associated with it, which is essentially its version, and each one of them can be updated completely independently of the others. Um, and you know this is of course plug-in driven because we don't know. Uh, what you're going to be, what what needs to be done with any given payload type. So, Horizon, our cloud system will handle all of the you know security, the delivery of the actual uh, blob of data. But then there's a, a plugin that you will provide that knows what to do with the the, the specific uh, specific binary bits that you're getting as part of the update. So what are some of the practical practical use cases? I, I mentioned uh, at the top, you know, the idea of uh, pr pr providing firmware updates for either the built-in Cortex-M that exists on just about all of our modules or an external MCU that happens to be on your custom carrier board. That's a, that's a, either of those are, are fairly common use cases for our customers when they have um, specific real-time or low power uh, needs and they want to uh, offload some of that processing to a lower power, lower power but more real time chip. Uh, so you can easily deploy a firmware update using this subsystem update. You know, and that could be uh, an RTOS based uh, payload for one of these microcontrollers. It could be some bare metal code. Uh, you know, whatever you want there. Another real common use case is media and branding assets. Um, the, the the one I mentioned a second ago about that provides a PNG file, which is essentially a splash screen. You know that makes it very easy if you, for instance, are deploying to numerous clients and they all want to brand it. Uh, you know, for unique for their rollouts, um, then you could have the same underlying operating system, same underlying application stack, and just keep that the the set of branding assets as a separate subsystem that can be updated independently. And it really reduces the uh, the the amount of uh, testing uh, and the size of your test mat matrix. Um, other things you could possibly update with this. Um, you know, deploying configuration files, calibration data. It doesn't have to be a completely separate device. Uh, you can actually use a subsystem to say update, you know, I don't know, Wi-Fi credentials or something that that is just a file in slash Etsy if you wanted to be able to update that over the air without having to, to, to go through the complexity of a full OS update. That works just fine. Uh, media files is kind of ties into branding assets depending on uh, how you're using it, but if you have a kiosk uh, device or something that has some kind of multimedia, uh, you know, videos and that kind of thing, you want to over time deploy updates to those. You could do that without having to 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 do uh, full OS. And then you know things like firmware for external devices such as cameras. Uh, you know they are they're going to have some specific protocol they speak, probably over USB. Maybe the the manufacturer provides. Uh, you know, a, a protocol or uh, an application that will actually allow you to, to, to deploy that update. So this would allow you to uh, tie that into the Horizon update system as well. But now let's talk about, a bit a bit about the building blocks. Uh, I mentioned Uptane, um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a standard out of the automotive space for providing update systems. Uh, you know, obviously in the automotive space, they have a lot of very complicated uh, needs. Uh, you know, the modern cars have, uh, you know, potentially tens to may maybe in some cases hundreds of uh, what they call ECUs, electronic control units that need to be updated uh, over the lifetime of the product. So Uptane is a, a, a very well thought out vetted security standard by uh, security experts. Uh, you know, it, it, it's basically a specification that says what pieces of metadata uh, in the system are signed and which keys are they signed by, where are the keys stored, how are they protected, and ultimately what attack scenarios you're protecting against uh, by the various components of the system with the ultimate goal being to guarantee that you're never running untrusted code on your devices. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the system is designed to be fault tolerant to the point where if the, the Uptane server somehow gets compromised, uh, as long as you've done uh, your, your due diligence properly with maintain, maintenance of certificates and that kind of thing, 
then even though the server is um, maybe compromised, you you can be get in, assured that your devices will not be installing that the untrusted code, which is obviously uh, the the not a, something we want to avoid at all costs. On the device side, uh, you know it's got it's resilient to uh, power cuts, unreliable networks. It's got retry pretty good retries built in. It's got automatic rollbacks in the case of update failures and things like that. So it, it really gives us a good base to start our update system on. And so Uptane has this concept of both primaries and secondaries. And in the automotive space, you know, primary is usually that in-vehicle infotainment system, uh, which is generally speaking going to be the most powerful uh, processor in the car. And it's the one actually running the, the client that talks to the Uptane server and uh, is able to update itself, but it's also able to proxy updates to the other ECUs in the system. And in, in, in Uptane terminology, those other ECUs are a secondary um, that, that, that is able to be updated. In the context of Horizon, uh, the primary is that OS tree based uh, bootable root file system. So inside that Linux instance running on the A core uh, on our system, on our modules, uh, there is the actualizer client, that's just the name of the client, uh, that is Uptane compliant and is talking to our server. It's able to update essentially itself as part of the OS tree root file system. And then uh, a secondary, that Docker Compose that you're actually able to update is actually a Terizon, uh, excuse me, is an update, Uptane secondary. And so what we've done with subsystem updates is essentially uh, abstracted the concept of an Uptane secondary and made it a little easier to configure and use uh, for the kinds of use cases that, that, we, that, that our customers need. So... Um, what what do the updates look like? So before uh, system updates, uh, you know this is kind of a, a typical IoT product that we see. You know the components in blue are all components that are that are on board the Toradex hardware, uh, and then the components in green, of course, are external things. They might be on your carrier board, or they might be in a in a housing somewhere connected over uh, some kind of connection cable to the product. Uh, but before system updates. Uh, you know, the, the items in green could e were able to be updated by uh, the Tryzen update system. Obviously, the applications, uh, the root file system kernel, those are all part of the, um, the, the that OS tree bootable root file system. And then, of course, the bootloader, which we, we rolled out, I don't know, 9, 12 months ago, something like that. That's all been updatable. However, now with the system update feature, we get the ability to update all the other components uh, in the system uh, as well as you know, things like config files and stuff. It's important to note that because of the way this is managed and shown as a actual component in the web dashboard, uh, you don't want to be too dynamic about it. And by that, I mean, you don't want to send down an update that then uh, functions one way if, uh, you know, some config file says something and functions another way if, an, if a config file says something different. You can, you can do that, but it really kind of will, will break some of the workflows and just some of the, the, the modeling that we do of the way these devices are, 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 are managed. So if you have a use case where you're thinking of doing something like that, please let us know because uh, it's possible that uh, we're, we're, we're just missing something and we need to, to add some uh, extra functionality here. Let's move on to the second poll. All right, I think we're about stabilized here. This is about what I would have expected. Um, MCU firmware obviously is a big one. Uh, config files, that's interesting. I'm surprised that uh, nobody has thought about media assets and branding. Uh, for those that issue, uh, said other, we would love to hear what use cases you may have. Uh, so if you're you're if you're willing to share that in in either the chat or the questions window, that would be great. Otherwise, if you want to reach out afterwards, uh, it's very easy to find us uh, through our developer site or uh, through um, uh, through our local uh, local account reps. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper and talk about you know a little bit more of the details. So this this slide kind of shows at, at a very coarse level all the the, the things that happen. Uh, from within, uh, from when an update is triggered to the update being finished and installed on the device. Obviously, th there's a lot of details that this is gl th 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 this gloss is over, but uh, you know a lot of this is specified by Uptane. Um, so the device is actually polling. It sees that an update's available. All the Uptane security checks that I mentioned are done on the device to verify signatures and things like that. 
uh, artifacts are then uh, downloaded and then they're installed by, for, by whatever definition that that means for the, the artifact type. And then the, the, the reporting of the status of the update it happens back to the server, and in which case on the cloud side, the update is considered finished. So, you know, it's important to note that, you know, the only box that you as the customer uh, or user of this system have to provide is that it, essentially that install step. And we'll take a look at exactly what that means, but the, the important part with that is that all the security checks happen before it gets to you, so you're not sacrificing any of the, the, the security guarantees that, uh, that Uptane pro provides by using this feature. But note, it is a generic feature. Um, you know, you, you can use it however you want. You're going to essentially be getting a file uh, that represents the payload, and you can do with it whatever you want in that install uh, script. So we will at some point provide um, some, some, some kind of reference implementations for common use cases, but in most, in, in most environments, you're going to have to uh, implement that yourself depending on the exact needs of your, of your system. So uh, yeah, so so this kind of just uh, reinforces what I just said. You you have to configure it, and we will provide predefined use cases and documentation. Um, we, we do have a GitHub link that we'll look at later, where we're starting to gather uh, these action handlers that implement certain use cases. So you know, content management for config files, calibration files, and other assets will will eventually have something up there. Uh, the built-in Cortex M, uh, I, the one I am going to be demonstrating today, will eventually will make its way up there. Uh, I know the one there is one up there now uh, for updating a Node MCU ESP based device, so uh, that kind of thing is certainly possible. And then other external devices, uh, for the most part, it will provide general documentation, but uh, since, since those are going to be very dependent on the exact devices in, in play, uh, you know, we're going to have to leave it to you guys to define exactly what those uh, things are. Um, so when you're actually defining the subsystems, uh, there are two main steps, and I know it's kind of hard to read these files here. We'll take a look at them in the running systems here in a minute as part of the demo. But the first step is to define the subsystem, uh, and this is where you tell the actualizer client that you have a subsystem of some kind. You give it a name, you give it a path where it's going to store its binaries, and you give it the action handler, uh, which is essentially the callback uh, that you're going to define. And then you need to define the actions uh, or essentially that that action handler, and inside that action handler, you need to handle each of the uh, various types of uh, application or, or operations that, that that can be called uh, from the actualizer update client. Okay, so what are we going to demo? Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, I've got two that I want to show. I was hoping to have a third one set up, but I didn't manage to get the time. Uh, but I, I, it's that one I just mentioned that my colleague Lucas, who was actually on the line, developed. Uh, it's basically using uh, AVR Dude running in a, in a uh, Docker container to update firmware on an ESP32 device that happens to be attached over USB. Um, and so that is certainly uh, a Probably I expect a lot of people to do things like that because those devices are so readily available and accessible. I didn't I, I, I didn't manage to get that set up in time for, for this webinar, uh, but that is available in our GitHub if you want to take a look at that. But the two that I will be demoing, one is updating the media asset, uh, like I say, the PNG splash screen. Um, and, and the advantage here, of course, is that we're able to update it without sending a whole lot of data. We're only updating that one file, so it's fast, uh, and we don't have to reboot or relaunch containers or anything. And the second one, which is uh, I think the one that's interested that that, that interests most of you, is updating uh, FreeRTOS firmware uh, on the Cortex M4. Uh, in 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 my demo case, on one of our Calibri IMX7 based devices. Now I'm not going to 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 win any awards for my uh, FreeRTOS coding skills on this one, uh, but uh, it's a, you know it's a, it's basically hello world for FreeRTOS. But we'll take a look at that here in a minute. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, so for the first update, actually, I'll start here at my uh, KVM window. Give this a second to refresh. So this is actually what you're seeing uh, over my shoulder on the actual display that's there. Um, and this is just a, a Qt application uh, that is displaying a file uh, in, a, in a known location. And it just pulls that file, and if that file changes, it it changes what's on the screen. It's all it's dynamic uh, from that perspective, and doesn't require restarting or anything like that. So if we come over here to the board that's actually running it, you see uh, you see that I'm actually running Qt Image Display is the name of the application. 
Now, the first file that we want to look at, that's not the one I wanted to look at. This one, this is the config file uh, for Actualizer. Um, and this is a there's a standard format for for creating and or modifying these files. So if you need to to make changes to the way you know if you want to use a different secondary config file for whatever reason, you can put a version of that file under Etsy uh, and and modify it there. Um, but so this is just defining this secondaries.json file, uh, which is that first step that I mentioned a second ago, that where you actually have to define the uh, define your your subsystem. So in this case, we see uh, the first one that's here is Docker Compose. Now, now as I mentioned, this has always been here as part of the Horizon system, and this is not actually exported as a subsystem. So the main difference between this and a subsystem is, you know, the subsystem is anything under Horizon generic, and the big difference is this action handler path. Um, so the actions for this specific Docker Compose. Uh, update type are uh, essentially hard coded in the in the the Horizon system, but when you're adding updates, that's when we get down to 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 these lines here in the Horizon generic section. Um, you see the you know the first set here is for bootloader updates, and you can actually see the action handler for bootloader updates is right here. So if you wanted to dig into how to Horizon implements uh, bootloader updates on remote actions uh, on remote devices in the field, that's here, and it's uh, you know just a bash script that you can dig into. Um, for purposes of this, of this demonstration, uh, we've got this other uh, uh, subsystem defined here, and so the ECU hardware ID that's just essentially the name of it. It's called image conf. We define a directory that it's going to use for storing its data, um, and then the, the the keys we're just using the same keys that are used for everything else. Um, so the firmware path. So this is what file will be written by the actual download of the payload from uh, the Actualizer client. So the you know once Actualizer has downloaded it, then the file is is, is under this name here. There's some other metadata that you can get access to, uh, and. and uh, and that metadata can then be used in this action handler to uh, customize how the action handler works. So let's take a look at the action handler now. So in this case, it's a pretty simple bash file. Uh, it's just a, a, a switch statement uh, based on the, the first parameter that's passed in. And that first parameter is simply the, the operation that is, that, uh, is happening. Uh, get for more info that gets called periodically by the update system to essentially return inventory back to the platform. Um, and then the meat of this particular uh, update type is install. And all we're doing here is copying that file that, that was defined above and is available in here as the, the environment variable secondary firmware path. We're just copying that into home horizon image.png, just a hard coded path name, uh, making sure that the horizon user owns it. And then we're, we're returning this JSON status. Uh, we're echoing that, which gets packaged up and, and sent back to the, the horizon platform uh, as, as a status uh, and result of the update. And, and since that Qt app is just running in a container and it's just pulling this file, the simple fact of us updating it here causes the display to actually get updated. So let's jump over here to the Horizon platform, and we'll take a look. So this demo is, I'm doing this demo on my Veriden IMX8 Mini. And let's just go into the view detail. So if we scroll down to the components, now you see this is a live view of what uh, was on that first slide. So we see the base OS, the hash uh, for the OS, the application component, its hash. So those are basically versions from the point of view of the Horizon update system. We have a bootloader. In this case, it, it says there is no installed package, and that's simply because this device was installed directly to Horizon Core 6 using our easy installer, so no bootloader has been deployed over the air yet. It's just the one that was there in the default image. And finally, we see this the custom component that we're getting ready to update. So this is type image conf, and you see that we're running an, a package called Horizon Splash 2. Uh, and and it has a, a specific hash. So if I come over to the package list, so I'm filtering by my packages, and you see that I've actually got two here, one called Splash 1 and Splash 2, and I'm just going to be able to toggle back and forth between them. Uh, but just so you're aware, I mean, to add these, it's a simple matter of coming in here, clicking Other, 
and then you select component type. In this case, it'd be component type image conf. And I would just attach a package file. In this case, it would be the um, the 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 splash screen uh, PNG file. Uh, but since I've already uploaded it, I'm not going to do that now. But now that we've got all the components we need, I will go ahead before I start the update. I will start my journal CTL here. So we can see the logs from the uh, actualizer update client. And now we'll come back to our very mini and we will deploy an update. Just like you've always done with Horizon, you're just selecting a different component now. And it's going to obviously filter the packages based on the component type. Uh, we've got Splash 2 currently installed. We'll go ahead and install the Splash 1. And we say continue and go ahead and finish. So now we've initiated the update. We see that the update's pending. If we jump over here to the um, to the KVM view on the display, uh, in a few seconds we'll actually see now that image has been updated. So we just deployed an update uh, to the system uh, and you saw how quick it was, um, uh, and, and which is great for when you're deploying something like these media and branding assets. There's essentially no, no downtime from the end user perspective doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of bandwidth and that kind of thing. And of course, if we come back here to the uh, to the log messages uh, somewhere in here, we would actually see that yeah, all downloads complete. So uh, in this case, it didn't actually have to download anything since I had already done that update earlier in the day. But uh, that's just an optimization uh, that the system makes. So let's move on then to the um, uh, the 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 free RTOS update here. So it's the same same uh, config file and the same secondaries.json file. Uh, so let's take a look here. So up till now, it's identical to the one we just looked at. But in this particular device, I have a, a, an extra subsystem device, uh, defined called, appropriately enough, Cortex firmware. and Again, the, the the most the most interesting thing really here is this action handler path, um, and we'll take a look at that. So again, get firmware update uh, install is the bulk of what I'm doing. There are some other actions that I should probably handle uh, to make a a fully production ready release, uh, but for demo purposes, all I'm doing here is install. So I don't handle things like rollback or error conditions and things like that. Um, another thing that would need to be done to make this uh, a more production ready system is a as it stands today, I have no way to start the uh, Cortex uh, M4 firmware image running at boot. Uh, it's, o it's only done as part of this install action during an update. So to make this production ready, I would have to essentially put a version zero of the firmware uh, include that in the base operating system, and if if no no other version had had been installed into this location here, then uh, at boot I would create that uh, location uh, and 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 put the ver essentially put the version zero of the firmware there and start the firmware if that was appropriate for my application. So it, basically, what we're doing here is just you know we're creating a directory where we're going to store the firmware that that is going to be used by the remote proc system to deliver the firmware to the uh, to the microcontroller. So we're creating this directory of our Cortex firmware. We're put we're, we're uh, if there is a firmware there, we're actually backing it up so we can uh, safely use it for rollback. Um, and then we're copying this environment variable here, secondary firmware path. This is actually provided, uh, this is provided in the environment by Actualizer when it calls into our script. And this is the actual binary that was downloaded as part of the update. So we're just copying it from there to this location, which is where uh, the Linux kernel is going to expect it. And then we're configuring the Linux kernel, uh, telling it what path, uh, where, where firmware binaries are going to be stored for the remote proc system by writing to this uh, sys class uh, file, this sys, sysfs file system entry. Normally that would be in lib firmware, uh, but since lib firmware is uh, in the OS tree system uh, in Horizon, that's read only, so we have to actually move it somewhere else. And then we're stopping the, the current microcontroller. Uh, and if it happens to already be started, stopped, this will error out, which is why I just 
I, I say or true just to make sure that we don't get a, an, an unexpected error here. And then we write the name of the firmware binary into this sys node here. And then we simply say start, uh, and that will start it running. And just like the other uh, one we looked at, we have to return the JSON uh, to send the send the the, the uh, response back to the server. So if we come over here, actually, I will go ahead and clear the screen here. And now we're connected to the serial port uh, that is on the, uh, the 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 microcontroller in this case. And if we come back here to our Horizon platform in our Calibri IMX seven uh, detail view, you'll see that we now have a custom component for uh, Cortex firmware. Uh, and currently it's saying that I have uh, 0 0.2 installed. That one was uh, one that I installed this morning. Uh, but as I said, uh, since uh, it only starts the Cortex uh, M4 on uh, deployment, uh, it's not actually running now since I've rebooted the device. So let's go ahead and we will deploy a, a new firmware. So in this case, uh, I only have one package, but I actually have two, uh, two versions. And actually before I do that, I did want to uh, point out um, with um, with the image conf, I use the web UI uh, to upload the packages, and with the uh, with the, the these firmware images, I used our Horizon Core Builder tool, uh, and you can see the, the the syntax here. It's basically the same thing you've always done for sending either OS tree or um, Docker Compose updates, but instead now you're specifying the hardware ID of something different, and then the the ref uh, in the in this case is just the 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 path name to the elf file. In this case, I've got one that's broken and one that's fixed. Um, so, and you can also pass additional metadata and, and things like that uh, from for, from the command line version. There's a few things you could do from Horizon Core Builder that are not uh, at immediately uh, accessible in the UI today. Um, so, we'll go ahead and install 0 0.1. And before I click deploy, I will also go over here and we'll do journal. We'll pull up the journal logs because it does go pretty quickly. So now we'll start our deployment. And so if we come back here so on its next polling interval, we'll start to see some things happen here. And it says there's new updates found. Again, images uh, already downloaded just like the other one. But now we see that these are actually not in the journal CTL. These are actually kernel log messages uh, indicating that um, the remote proc subsystem has actually started something. And if we come over here, now we start to see that there's text output. But we clearly have a problem. Uh, so this free RTOS application is two different, uh, two different tasks, both printing to the, the, to the serial console, and there's no mutex to separate them, so the text gets in or leave. So uh, we, we uh, do deploy an update to fix that. Come back here. We initiate another update of Cortex firmware. And we're going to select the fixed version, which is 0 0.2. And that will run. And shortly we should see the that interleaving fixed. So there we go. So now we have one time it says presented by Horizon system updates and then three hello worlds and then it just loops. So this is actually being done by two separate tasks uh, in the free RTOS system. So that's it for the demo. Um, here's a list of references. Um, I've actually got most of these things up here. So this GitHub link, which is in the slides, uh, and is uh, all these references are also pasted in the chat. This is the the where we where we will be storing the reference subsystem actual ha action handlers. This is the one I mentioned uh, that that uses AVR dude to update a. Um, uh, an ESP32 that's attached. You see this one also really does just the install. Uh, there is a spec for these action handlers that gives you all the details of all the actions you might need to handle, all the environment variables that are available, how you get access to the metadata and things like that. Um, we have a, a number of uh, pieces of documentation available. This is ge the, the general over, uh, excuse me, the general overview on our horizon.io site. And then we have some more detailed uh, documentation here on our development site on how to use it, first steps, 
and uh, getting the overview. So these are all uh, all good places to start to get more information and I certainly encourage you to take a look uh, and if you have questions reach out. Uh, we've got our, our community site which is our forum site where you can easily uh, ask questions and, and get support issues handled and that kind of thing. So uh, just to, to, to kind of to close here, uh, I would like to, to encourage you to get started with Torizon today if you have not. If you have already, if you have Toradex hardware already, it's very easy to get up and running. Uh, if you don't, uh, you, can act, you can request some sample hardware from your local account rep, or we do have uh, some support on uh, some, some uh, commercially available boards, like a couple of variants of the Raspberry Pi, uh, a couple of x86s and things like that. Pre-built images are available for uh, a number of the platforms, and if you are starting uh, a new account, uh, you get full access to all the, the features uh, that are part of Horizon for 30 days, and if you need more than that, uh, just reach out and uh, one of our account reps will be in touch. And with that, we've got some uh, time for some questions. Uh, at this point, my colleague Stefano is going to join. Uh, he is the architect of uh, Torizon and uh, probably will be able to give you a lot more detail than I will about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the low-level specifics. Um, but let's go ahead and start. I can get this first one. Do I have to use a bash script for my custom action handler? The answer to that is no. Um, uh, you, as long as it's an executable that, uh, that, that processes uh, both the, the, the environment variables as well as the command line parameters, you can write it in any, any language you want. Um, you know, I think in most cases, bash, uh, bash script is probably simplest, but uh, if you have other needs, uh, it's just uh, Actualizer will just uh, simply fork your process uh, and, and provide the parameters. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody's asking about updating FPGA firmware via the main system microcontroller. Stefano, you want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We can consider an FPGA as whatever uh, external uh, microcontroller. No, I, I personally have also experience with FPGA, so more or less I know how they work. You know, you have a like a bit stream that need to be flashed. Of course, there are, you know, uh, custom scenario, but the concept is always the same. You can get your artifact, your binary in this case will be a bit stream. And you can get it by using all our, uh, you know, security infrastructure. And then the only stuff that you need to write, it's the way on how this bit stream will be flashed in your FPGA. Usually there are many way, many tool that the chip vendor of the FPGA provide you. And uh, I don't see any problem. It's just a matter, you know, to really get that bit stream when it's ready and perform the command required to to flash it you know and then it's also guys it's also you know a matter on how um, you want to implement it you know because there is a, a possibility even to check back what you for example you flash it is the the one that you actually want you know you can even check it after a reboot you know to, to report the correct status on the platform however you have a you know way to to play around and um, yeah very good thanks stefano um, let's see. Do system do subsystem updates work using lockboxes? Uh, my understanding is yes. Stefano, can you confirm? Yeah, hundred percent. Just for the people that maybe is not used with our terminology, lockbox is uh, what is uh, maybe commonly called the offline update. And yes, basically you can generate a lockbox that it's as I said an offline update for operating system update, but even for uh, your custom subsystem update. So yes, very nice, very nice. Um, let's see. How can I handle a scenario where I should update a media asset, which is a video file that must be played by my Dockerized application? Uh, okay, so that's yeah. So and that's not just this. That's this is an issue with any kind of. Uh, data that's going to be processed by your your dockerized application uh you need to uh somehow have that file mapped as a volume into the container uh but the complication there is you don't want to app you don't want to if 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 my understanding is correct you don't want to map the file itself because once the container is started if the file changes that may it may not be notified about it but if you map the directory that the file is stored in then 
um, then you, you can access the file and any changes to that file will be uh, will, will be recognized by the container. I believe that's how it works, but uh, uh, it's pretty um, it, that 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 should get you get you there. I haven't. I mean, that's kind of how that's kind of how we did it with that uh, image update application that I showed. Uh, it's just a file in the Horizon users home directory. Uh, Stefano, was that mapped by path, or was that mapped by the directory, or was that mapped to the file itself? You know? No, it was a, was a directory, you know, it was just a, a okay. shared directory between container and the host system, and the application was only reading, you know, uh, that specific file in the in the shared directory. But, of course, with the video, there are more challenges, you know, because the the image is something that changed in one second, no, less than one second, in milliseconds. The video, you know, if it's a long video and you are in the process of replacing him, you know, maybe you can have something strange on the screen. So I think you need to play a bit with the code, uh, you know, but it's, sure. it's, it's a matter, you know, to really just handle it at code level. But the idea yeah. to pass the file, it's just needed a shared volume, you know, should be enough to to share, you know. Very good, very good. Uh, compatibility checks based on the installed OS version. Can you define those? Yeah, that's standard Uptain uh, to Rising Cloud stuff. If you look at, you know, I can actually show that here real quick. So if we come over to the Horizon dashboard, in fact, I think I set up compatibilities here um, for some of my uh, image comp. So if we look at Horizon Splash 1, uh, uh, maybe not. Okay, maybe, I, maybe I'm uh, looking in the wrong place. Ah, here we go. Uh, uh, configure compatibilities, yeah, so... Okay, I said that. I know I. Oh, sorry. It's the other way around. You specify. Stefano, what am I missing here? <laughs> I know I did this yesterday, and now I can't find it. Uh, should be in the um, in the operating system. I mean, but but depend what means compatibility. I mean, uh, what we have today is that a specific package uh, can be should be compatibility OS package. It's uh, yeah. It's empty now, right. but yeah, I mean, no, but it's when you create, I think you can add it. If you try to add Oh, right, package, right, 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 yeah. That, yeah you know, you now, if, if you that. haven't added, you don't see it. But yeah, if you add a new package, it will ask you for compatibility. Yeah. Right. It, I think I think I think that's one of the features that in fact, I think you and I talked about this yesterday. I think that's one of the things that has to be done using Horizon Core Builder today. Uh, it may not be available in the web UI if I'm remembering right, but yes, you can. Yeah, there are, you know, you because can. there are, um, we have one field handled by the UI and this is the compatibility one. But if you have a complex metadata to add to your package, that, that's, a, I think, important to share this. Because, for example, in the example that you shared about the Cortex M4, could be, even for example, for the FPGA, you know, the um, user that asked this. Now, maybe you need to ship not only the binary, but extra instruction on how to flash that bitstream. We have a uh, the architecture allow you to add the custom metadata, and this is possible today only with the Horizon Core Builder that you already shared no, during your demo. Why mm -hmm. this? Because, you know, doing this on the web UI, since it's kind of generic, it's kind of complex so but with the the command line too you are able to ship uh, additional object as i said because it's uh, as i said it's not that you can share just uh, key value fields as extra metadata but actually you can uh, uh, share objects you know json object so definitely you can play you know in uh, many ways you can use the compatibility field or you can have a more advanced you know compatibility object you know what i mean very good uh, let's see. Okay, so where are dependencies handled? Uh, the in for for instance, an M4 firmware version that must have a specific version of the the Linux kernel, whatever. Uh, we we don't have dependencies in that manner today, apart from uh, saying that you know, this particular M4 package only works on this particular OS. So I kind of, I guess that kind of gets you what you need, but I would still recommend if you have those tight dependencies that you do some post install checks and that kind of thing, just to make sure uh, that, that that you have uh, the versions you need and, you know, roll back obviously uh, in the case 
where uh, uh, things are not right. But uh, you can add that dependency to from a, a version of a package to an OS tree release. So that, that may give you what you need. But Drew, just uh, since it's connected to what we answered just before, with this custom metadata, no, you can, for example, ship your Cortex M4 firmware, add a field that could be kernel compatibility, add a mm -hmm. version, you know, for example, it's compatible with Linux 6.1. So when you start the installation, of course, in your installation script, you can just check what is my current kernel installed. Okay, 6.2. Right. What is the compatibility? Shipped 6.1. Okay, is it not compatible? Let's, uh, uh, you know, uh, return an error. So you, in right. this case, you even don't install. So I think you have a, you have a really space to play around. So yeah, yeah, and it's important to note that the compatibility check that's part of our, our cloud service is done on the server. Um, so, um, yep. the compatibility check that uh, Stefano just described is actually done on the client and, you know, there's definitely good uses for both, both of them, right? That, that one on the client is the very last step and you can actually, you can do a lot more detailed stuff there. So we'd certainly recommend, uh, recommend that workflow. Um, can I update my devices with on-prem or does it require Torizon.io? Um, well, I mean, we do have some uh, some on-prem offerings. Uh, if if that's a need you have, please reach out, um, and uh, we we can put you in touch with the the account reps that can talk about that further. Uh, it's not it's not something that we have uh, a, a, as you know an easily downloadable uh, on-prem thing. But uh, but for the most part, today you're going to be using our our platform on that. Um, how is the MCU firmware delivered? Where is it stored before running the update? Uh, it is stored uh, somewhere in VAR. So let me jump back over here. If we take a look at the action handler, uh, actually, I'm not sharing my screen, or I guess I am sharing. My yeah, screen yeah, you are still. sharing. No, oh, it's perfect. Uh, so in the action, So you see that we are actually copying the file called secondary firmware path. And this is all part of the subsystem up definition, which is in this file here. Yeah. Let's just cat it. So in this case, we actually pass uh, the, the client directory. So the actualizer is actually storing this the way I have it defined under slash var, which is not managed by OS tree. Um, uh, and, and since it's, uh, since it requires read, write, you wouldn't want to put this in OS tree, then actualizer would not be able to write to it. You could potentially put it in slash Etsy. I don't know how valuable that would be. My recommendation would be in general, just leave it in var soda storage. And then if you need it somewhere else, uh, copy it there. Like I did in the action handler script. Um, for branding assets that are put into Varsota, should there always exist a revision zero in OS tree so that it works before doing their first OTA update of the asset? I would think yes. I don't, I mean, I can envision maybe there are cases where you wouldn't want to do that, but, uh, uh, that, that, that seems like that, that, that should be required somehow, right? So you would probably put, like you say, revision zero in OS tree. I like that terminology. I think that kind of defines it. And then you would obviously have to have some kind of system D startup script that knows how to handle handle that. Uh, if the one that you're looking for in VAR doesn't exist, then copy the one out of OS tree and, and launch it from there. Uh, but th that's really going to be dependent on their, um, uh, on, on your specific use case. Drew, just one note about this, because I know that recently remote proc has also a way to auto load a firmware. You know exactly how it works, uh, the Wi-Fi firmware, you know, because you use the same kernel interface. So basically there is a kind of default path that the system when boot try to see if it's available a firmware under, I remember it's a USR lib firmware somewhere. And if it's available there, the system will load it even without any system disservice. So of course, if you want to act the system, you know, you want to change the loading path or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You need to do what you, what you shared, let's say, but there, there are, uh, you know, even in this case, many way to do to do this stuff. But uh, uh, you know, you don't need to really reinvent the wheel. There are a, a standard way to do this. So, okay. 
Yeah, uh, let's see. Somebody's asking, is there a way to load the firmware without using Uptain? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, all the, the, the commands that I did in that action handler script uh, are just running on Linux. So if you have the firmware binary, uh, this is kind of like that, 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 that version zero question that we just talked. If you have a version of that binary somewhere in your root file system, then you just use the remote proc interface. There's also a mechanism in U-Boot uh, where you can load it at boot. Uh, in my particular case, uh, there was an issue. If I started the firmware in boot and then launched the Linux instance, there was some kind of conflict uh, you have to be careful about what's in the device tree and how things are handled uh, to, be, to to allow that to uh, to, to seamlessly hand it off. So uh, it, it can definitely do that. Uh, it can definitely be updated without using these subsystem updates uh, as long as there's a version of the file in your root file system. Let's see, how is the boot firmware updated? Um, ah, nice question. <laughs> yeah, so like boot and that kind of thing. You want, you want to handle that, Stefano? Yeah, 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 let me ask. I'm, uh, I'm very you know, happy to, to clarify this. So, um, boot firmware, I think you're talking about bootloader, and so in this specific case, you boot. So. As uh, maybe many people maybe don't know, but on all our Torizon product, we have basically an EMMC device. The EMMC out of the box provide you a kind of double partition system. I'm saying a kind of because it's not really actually a partition, but it's a kind of hardware feature that allow you to have two boot space. Let's call space. You have the EMMC boot zero is called the EMMC boot one. So what we do with the um, uh, yeah, bootloader upgrade is just handle these two partitions. So we see what is the active one. When we want to update the bootloader, basically what we do is download the new bootloader, do all the authenticity and integrity check, flash the bootloader in the second partition, read back the bootloader to see if what we flashed is exactly what you know was intended to. And then we do what is called an atomic switch. Even this is a kind of uh, um, hardware feature. The MMC have uh, uh, one register that where you can select which boot partition should be used, and it's atomic. So what I want to say during this switch, if there is even a power cut, never will come that is in an intermediate state. Will be or zero one. So that's what we do. And guys, I really suggest that if you are curious to this, everything that we developed about this topic, everything is open source. It's open source the action handler, um, it's open source the implementation of subsystem update because it's part of the actualizer and it's, uh, it's open source everything, the operating system. So if you are really curious to go deep in detail because yeah, the action handler for the bootloader is complex because we handle all the edge cases, the rollback, so, you know, it's complex. And let me highlight one uh, last stuff about this. Um, the NXP processor is also able to understand if you put in a boot partition something invalid. If you put something invalid in the partition, the um, state machine, let's say, of that processor is able to understand there is uh, something invalid and will automatically switch to the, the other one. Uh, yeah, that's it. Then, I mean, uh, it's way more complex if we want to go really in detail, but I think that's enough to give you like uh, an overall idea on how this works. Okay, so just time for a couple more quick ones here. Uh, is there rollback uh, for M4 uh, specifically is the question, but uh, in general, subsystem updates do provide rollback. Uh, it does require a little bit of, of work on your part in the action handler. Uh, Stefano, it, it does, if, I, if, I, if I remember right, uh, Actualizer actually saves the old version automatically or does the action handler yeah. need to do that? No, no, we automatically have, uh, no, we, it's not that we save, we have, um, um, we provide uh, a, a path where you can save uh, 
the last working firmware before to flash the new one. And then this is up to the user because of why this is not because we are lazy and we haven't implemented uh, anything better, but because it changed. You know, to be generic, we don't know what you need for the rollback. Right. Maybe sometimes it's just, you know, save a firmware somewhere, do a check and eventually refresh. But in other case, imagine with, with some system update, in theory, you can even flash devices that are network connected. You know what I mean? So maybe it will be totally different your, uh, your rollback. So that's why we just prepared uh, really basic ingredients that you can reuse to actually implement your own rollback. Yep. All right, well, very good. And that brings us to the end of time. So I wanna thank everybody uh, for your time. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, everybody else, uh, all of my other colleagues uh, for putting this together. Uh, if you did, did did have, there was some questions we didn't get get answers uh, in, the, in the webinar, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you see a lot, all the contact information on the slide here. Uh, and we will be uh, happy to get those questions answered. Thank you so much. Thank you.